designed and focused on a holistic journey with a child um, involving educational. And the name Hulang is Sitwana and it means growth. And this is a place where people grow. As a part of as part of, a part of the people, um, I myself have grown from this place. We decided to start the garden because of poverty. Our community are within poverty. And you know, it's sad to say to find that there are still kids that are going uh, uh, for going the whole day without eating anything. So here starting this garden, it also gives us uh, more uh, energy to save our community to minimize because sending proposal to different companies for food is becoming difficult for everyone because COVID hit us so hard. So having the idea of starting the garden, uh, it was to minimize also the cost of going outside and begging to so many people for food. In our garden, it's natural. We don't put any foreign uh, crops within or any foreign objectives. We don't use fertilizer, we don't use anything else. We manufacture our own uh, manure each and every year. We do our best to make sure that we, we recycle more, more of the grass, more of the leaves from the trees to make our own uh, manure. Secondly, the crops that we do plant in within our gardens, normally, especially here in this community, we find out that a majority of people, they like spinach and also they like uh, beetroot and thirdly they like uh, also which is green paper. How we maintain the, our gardens in a, uh, within the harsh conditions, uh, we normally go to the farms uh, to fetch the uh, mesh. The mesh is the dry grass that we uh, go and fetch and we cover mostly our plants within our gardens. That is the one that uh, other method that we use to cover it. And secondly the other one is when you are planting your seed, the time you are planting your seed, you need to minimize water. If you plant it today, you give it water today, you can skip two days and then you give it after two days. You are helping it to hold on to the water that you are giving it. Even if the harsh, uh, difficult conditions of the weather comes, it will still stand. We have a program that runs from Monday to Saturday, it includes educational, academically, um, it includes art and culture, we've got um, um, food parcels that are able to be given out from the center, including Mandela Foundation, MNF, um, giving out um, the food parcels um, in, for, for the people in Zanspray. So the center itself is a place where people come in and find different things and find themselves in, in different parts of um, activities that are given. From the Each One Feed One uh, partnership with Hulang Educational Outreach uh, Gardening Program, we started with food parcels and we saw that it was not sustainable for the people and we began to invest in gardening programs that are sustainable for the people moving forward um, and also uh, for the people to not just eat from the garden but just rip from the garden also be empowered um, by the gardens and by the people that are providing the skills um, from the garden. My dream for the center is the center itself to empower and reach as, to as many as possible people uh, with little resources that we have. And as for that, we as a center, we want to grow and we want to do more. And as we want to do more, there are so many things that we lack in, in, in doing more. So uh, this is a call to every corporate, everyone that's um, listening or seeing this video, to come in and join hands and it takes the world and takes the community to raise the child and raise the community like Sanspirit. We lack a lot of resources. Um, like we, we lack a lot of gardening equipment, we lack a lot of um, classes, that, um, extra classes for everyone with electricity and we lack a lot of um, technical stuff like um, nowadays people are on internet and, and all of that so we don't have that and we lack a lot of um, resources that would help um, develop the community itself and as a center of hope we do call out to help. I would encourage um, everyone to start their own home-based garden because our garden cannot feed everyone in Zanspray. And if you have your own home-based garden, you, are, you have a garden in your own space and a survival platform in your own space where you can grow your own organic um, vegetable and you are able to survive from what you have, from what you, what you can do where you are.
We were there when no other newspaper dared print on a Sunday. When Madiba took his first steps to freedom. And when man took a giant leap for mankind. We were there when our country kept up its fight for freedom. When a young athlete crossed borders to cross the finish line. When South Africa welcomed the world. And when music spoke louder than words. Because we've been publishing the right now since 1906. Sunday Times, the paper for the people. The One Africa Award recognizes the achievements of African-based organizations fighting to end the continent's cycle of extreme poverty and inequality. This year's prize money of 100,000 US dollars honors those who have created new job opportunities and refuse to give up in the face of adversity. Review the incredible work of our 2022 finalists. Elena is an NGO based in Cameroon that began as a grassroots effort to create garments and provide vocational training for young women who could not access secondary school for further education. Elena's goal is to ensure that poor people in the hinterland can live in dignity and economic security while providing for their children and youth through creative programs that promote these values with the dream of a future where the poor and the powerless are treated with respect and dignity. This group works to bring about social and economic change. To learn more, visit elenangeo.org. Buni Media is a Kenyan media company that creates and disseminates media in various formats, including but not limited to video, audio, animation, digital, and print. They also host events, select content, and provide training and education and multimedia production. Buni Media is an organization that promotes transparency and accountability in society, citizen participation in government, and the right to free expression to foster a thriving creative economy. Learn more about Buni Media at bunimedia.com. The Youth Empowerment Strategy, based in South Africa, also known as YES, is a business-led initiative that aims to bring and reinvigorate the economy and provide young people with the fair opportunity and success by applying cutting-edge technical innovations. Through its network of business partners, YES can generate many new employment possibilities for young people in South Africa by leveraging the country's broad-based black economic empowerment strategy. The company has made a significant impact in society and operates more effectively. To learn more, visit yesforyouth.coza. From its early roots, aiding suppressed communities in Latin America, to its current work in establishing more sustainable supply chains, Solidaridad, based in Kenya, is an international civil society organization which has over 50 years of expertise in devising ways to make communities more resilient. Their work centers on international cooperation with small-scale and family farmers, farm laborers, mine workers, and the communities they serve. To learn more, visit solidarity.network.org. Wouldn't you like to explore a country where two worlds intersect, where first world infrastructure meets an emerging market? where diversity is celebrated through its people and its sectors. Where one of the most powerful economies in Africa embraces new opportunities. Where science and technology enjoy rapid advancement. A land where innovation creates a dynamic environment for growth. The world's leader in mining and minerals, with nearly 90% of all the platinum metals on Earth, and around 41% of all the world's gold. Home to 11 Nobel Peace Prize winners. And with the most UNESCO World Heritage Sites in Africa. It is one of only two countries in the world to have hosted three different World Cups, where a market of almost 60 million people provide you with the perfect springboard to access a continent of 1.3 billion people. It's where the impossible is made possible. Welcome to South Africa, a land of endless possibilities. A truly inspiring country. Welcome to the future. Invest in South Africa. Powered by Brand South Africa.
Greetings to the Nelson Mandela Foundation and all present stakeholders today. My name is Ndutu Zimkono from ITS Foundation in partnership with the NMF, Nelson Mandela Foundation, on food distribution in one of their programs called Each One, Feed One. We've got some information to share regarding the Nelson Mandela Foundation response to KZN floods and the relief that was offered in KZN. Is there a relation between climate change and food security then? And if so, what is the relation? The COVID-19 pandemic and climate change has had serious implications for the global economy, with food security and nutrition being particularly impacted throughout the South Africa, including KZN, a region rich in agricultural produce. These factors were mainly driven by rising transports, food prices, and loss of crops due to the lockdown and natural disasters, bad weather, Farmed produce could not be sold as community markets or as an urban area and wasted away as it could not be stored for a long period of time, which impacted the livelihoods of small scale farmers. This was further impacted by the high rise of food prices as local stores, and lastly, by loss of family income for those that lost their jobs due to companies shutting down due to the COVID 19 pandemic. What can organizations or companies do? to assist and improve their resilience towards such shocks. The climate change will affect both food security and the livelihoods of those engaged in production systems and their value chains. Climate change also impacts agricultural production, supply chains and pricing. Food access is linked to a stable food supply chain, which is heavily reliant on climate changes. What is immediate relief? And what is IT Lab's role towards it? By promoting good agricultural practices to increase incomes. Practices such as crop rotation and drip irrigation, raise yields, decrease production cost and increase gross margins. Implement adaptation methods that reduce loss risk from extreme weather events. Promote technologies and practices that benefit a wide range of crops. And lastly, support research, development and adoption of new innovative agri-tech solutions. Why is immediate relief important? Is it as important as sustainable solutions such as the establishment of gardens? Immediate relief is crucial as it means livelihood. People who are displaced and homeless cannot immediately benefit from gardens which will only produce food after months. They need to feed and survive daily and our immediate food relief addresses this issue. Allowing beneficiaries to survive another day and have provision and sustenance for the rest of the month, which will keep them alive. So at this level, uh, we need to change our thinking. We cannot look for miracles, but we can always look for progress. Thank you.
build up to Nelson Mandela Day. Today, the Nelson Mandela Foundation, along with its partners, is in Mbezo, rooted in the methodology of the Transit Walk Dialogue, which centers communities' experiences as well as knowledge. Today, we focus on one of our pillars for Mandela Day, being the planting of indigenous and fruit trees. The theme for Mandela Day this year is the intersection between climate change and food security. As such, we've identified three cardinal pillars. The first is community and home-based gardens, understanding the need for members of the community to cultivate their own food in order to address the issue of food security. The second, the planting of indigenous and fruit trees. And of course, this highlights the intersection between climate change and food security with a particular focus on fruit trees. The last pillar then looks at positive climate action. Having seen what happened in KwaZulu-Natal and here in the Eastern Cape, we understand that there is a need to take action and reduce our carbon footprint. Uh, in this school, uh, what we are trying to impart on learners is that uh, strive to reach your full potential. But in doing so, never lose sight of where you're from. Always be anchored from where you're from and be of service in the environment you came from. It is the Nelson Mandela Foundation's global core to ensure that uh, because Madiba dedicated 67 years of his life serving humanity, he should be able, in honoring his legacy, to dedicate 67 minutes of our uh, day uh, doing good in the communities we live in. We are very much privileged to be afforded an opportunity by Green Development Foundation, Nelson Mandela Foundation, and Nelson Mandela University. To us, it means a lot. Uh, we are also inspired by the theme that says do what you can where you are. And the trees that we have planted today are the trees of hope. It is the hope that kept Madiba uh, standing. It is the hope that contributed to his resilience and he never gave up. So if we are planting the seeds of hope for this school, we are hopeful that all the challenges that we have expressed will come to an end. We are hopeful that it is through partnership with different stakeholders that have come to share our cries and challenges that we can prosper. And what inspires us most, most are the partners that have just come here. We are an agricultural school, so when we talk about Green uh, Development Foundation, we talk about us. We are a school that have to produce academics because we're building leaders. So if Nelson Mandela University is here, and then over and above, Nelson Mandela Foundation is our legacy. So if we are connected with as three potential partners, I think we can go into bigger heights. So as a school, we're very happy. The tagline for Mandela Day this year is do what you can with what you have where you are. And this speaks to different members of society at different levels. We're saying to individuals, plant where you can, whether it's a small patch in your garden or it's a bigger community garden. We're saying to corporate partners, support initiatives that speak towards combating the issue of food security by investing in community-based gardens. And we're saying to community-based organizations that are doing the work, continue to do the work as we try and support you on this journey. Today is the 18th of July and we are in Zwede in the Eastern Cape. We are marking Dada's birthday and as we reflect on the day where we took a transit walk dialogue through the community, we are reminded of the power of collaboration and co-creation. Our delegation walked through the community of Zwede talking and discussing about the different issues that face the community. We started in Zamugukanya Primary School, where we planted trees within that area. We learned about the challenges that face the primary school and saw different ways in which we can band together to assist them. We then moved on to a public facility known as the swimming pool that is unfortunately not functional at the moment. We heard that the borehole has a number of problems and understood that the community would like to get that uh, facility functional again. 
we moved on to home-based gardens where we saw beautiful produce at the hands of members of the community of Zwede. But there's no turning back. Uh, I think um, we have to stop, uh, uh, you know, the kind of one-stop type of interventions that universities have grown accustomed to over many, many decades. That must stop. When we engage with communities, we work with communities, we walk with communities, we co-travel with communities, we must ensure sustainability of the work that we do. For that very reason, our university is reorienting itself to be socially embedded within our society, within our communities, so that these projects can take a life of its own, you know, and develop sustainability matrices, you know, that can last, you know, very long into the future. The, the, the foundation is indeed about creating partnerships, whether it's here or in other parts of the country or with, with other parts, with other countries in the world, with the United Nations and so on. So it, it, it is our job to, to create spaces for conversations, which is why we have our, our annual lecture where we invite very important people who have influenced and made a positive impact on the world to come in and speak us, to us and tell us what they think about the world today. And uh, we are looking forward to Prime Minister Motley late, later this year, who is was said to be one of the ten important people in the world today. And we are so lucky to be able to get her to come and speak. So that's how that's how our, our I, th I think that part of the, the heart of our job is, is opening those connections, creating conditions for dialogue, creating conditions to bring people together to speak and, and converse and share ideas. We concluded our transit walk dialogue at this site, which is an eco garden that has been established by the Zwede Development Forum. We planted fruit and indigenous trees and also heard about some of the plans that the Zwede Development Forum has for this garden. Upon the conclusion of the Transit Walk Dialogue, we sat to hear the thoughts and insights of the community. the premier of Kozulu Natal. Kozulu Natal is proud to host the 20th Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture on the 12th of November 2022 at the Durban International Convention Center. This will be the first physical Nelson Mandela Lecture since the COVID-19 global pandemic. It is my honor on behalf of the provincial government and the people of Kozulu Natal to extend a hearty welcome to all our visitors to our ever warm, beautiful, and hospitable Kwazulu Natal. Our province is home to the spectacular Drakensberg Mountains, the Sandy Warren Beaches, the Isimangaliso Wetlands Park, the Big Five, and the historic Sun and Koi paintings. You will hear the mountains reverberate with the tales of victory over British, the arrest of Nelson Mandela, the roar of the majestic Utugela Falls, and most of all, the comforting warmth and hospitality of our people. As the reconstruction and rebuilding process unfolds after the devastating floods in April and May, issues related to climate change will come under the spotlight during this year's Nelson Mandela annual lecture. It is themed social bonding and decolonization in the context of the climate crisis, perspectives from the global south, and will this year be delivered by the Honorable Prime Minister of the Babies, Her Excellency Mia Motley. We look forward to hosting a thought-provoking and timely lecture in honor of our late beloved statesman and global icon Nelson Mandela. Siena Mugela, Kwazulu Natal. I do it because 
my village where I grew up, we used to go like three days without electricity. It really motivated me. I told my mom that one day I'm going to be an electrical engineer. This is my career, this is my life. Renewable energy is my life.
today we inaugurate the first annual Nelson Mandela Lecture. The lecture is part of a series of events being held this week to celebrate Nelson Mandela, the person and his contribution in creating a better world. The Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture will be developed as a prestigious public lecture attracting the best intellectual voices in the world. It will add to the larger public dialogue on critical social issues. The purpose of launching the Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture is twofold. First, it will be an occasion to celebrate Nelson Mandela's legacy. Secondly, it will provide a forum for the critical consideration of challenging social issues that confront us in the 21st century. Aluminum semi fabricator rolled products and extrusions business located in South Africa, supplying customers across Africa and the world, focusing on specific product and end use markets. As the only major aluminium rolling operation in sub Saharan Africa, Hulamin is one of the largest exporters, representing more than 60% of sales. Regional growth is important to us, and we aim to make a meaningful contribution to sustainable development in South Africa. Supported by sales offices in the USA and Europe and a network of international agents, we sell to leading manufacturers and distributors across many industries around the world. South Africa produces an abundance of primary aluminium. At Hulamin, we satisfy our customers' needs by processing this primary aluminium through our rolling mill and extrusion presses into a wide range of semi-fabricated products and specifications. Hulamin rolled products produces flat rolled aluminium products, foil, sheet and plate for customers in regional and international markets across the globe. Hulamin Extrusions focuses on customers in the Southern African regional market. In our containers business unit, we manufacture rigid foil containers which are supplied into the food industry domestically and internationally. Our corporate symbol, Hulamin's Circle of Synergy, illustrates our commitment to partnerships with our suppliers, customers, and the communities in which we operate. At Hulamin, each and every day, we think future, think aluminium. In 2007, we unbundled from Tonga Hewlett and listed on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. Hulamin, like the metal, has an exciting future. Our core purpose is to meet the expectations of our major stakeholders. We at Hulamin believe in mutual respect, working safely, honesty and integrity, customer value and teamwork. We meet these expectations by adding value to the businesses of our customers, building supply relationships for quality aluminium semi-fabricated products and operating our business in a sustainable manner. Our success is measured by the extent to which we are respected and admired by all our stakeholders. 
and regarded as an employer of choice, filled with pride in our achievements and making the world a better place. We recognize the importance of employing staff who play their role in making Fulamina a globally competitive business in the Armenian sector. We strive to distinguish ourselves as an attractive business to work for. Our logo represents us, our past, present and future. Our light and dark blue colors with white represent expertise, stability, trust and loyalty that for decades have been associated with our company. The precision of our sophisticated manufacturing processes as well as our continuous forward motion, focus and growth is still pride in the mid of respect. From humble beginnings in 1940, Fidamin has grown into a significant role and regional player in the Hanbei markets, a world of extremely Armenian products, exporting to more than 50 countries across the world. Aluminium is used in a wide range of forms and components of an enormous range of products from buildings, roads, airplanes, trucks, household appliances, packaging, and computers, to solar farms, and more. Some examples are made of the instruction used for vehicle crew boxes in the US. Our heat treated plate is used in California's silicon bay in the USA to manufacture computer chips. Beverage cans on all continents are made from Fulamin's can and construct. In Southern Africa, Fulamin is the supplier of choice for old and student aluminium products. To successfully compete in these demanding markets, Fulamin has established an impeccable set of features. These include the certification from Lloyds of London, DMV, SABS, TUV Rhineland, and the British Board of Agreement. As a responsible supplier, Hulamin recycles internally generated waste metal and fabrication scrap from customers. The new all aluminium can is recycled to ensure sustainability of our business and the environment. Hulamin's growth has been both consistent and significant with a 2.4 billion rands expansion in 2000, which increased capacity to more than 200,000 tons, 950 million rands in 2010, which increased nameplate capacity and more recently, technology investments in can stop and recycling. Positioning Hulamin as one of the world's leading suppliers of aluminium raw products. Hulamin's head office and raw products business are situated in the capital of Wazulu Town, Petermaritzburg. Located 80 kilometers inland from Durban, one of the world's best located ports. <laughs> Good afternoon. Greetings, everybody. San Bonan. I, I, I was about to address you fully in, in Zulu, then I was told not to because of the crowd that we have today. It's not because I can't speak it. Uh, it's because I, it's for your sake that I'm not using the language. So please, if you can excuse me. The, um, the Premier who's about to come on the, and other uh, leaders of government, Mrs. Marshall, the Mandela family, the Zuma family, trustees of the Nelson Mandela Foundation led by Professor Njabulon Debele, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to what is a very special edition of the Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture. We have a special speaker, of course, and we'll get to that in a moment. Here today, it is the confluence of three dimensions which give our gathering a distinctive quality. It is the first properly post-COVID edition, or as they say, uh, annual lecture BC was like this, annual lecture before COVID. It's a wonderful physical coming together of people, which becomes the lecture's uh, fulcrum for the first time since 2019. And doesn't it feel good to be here together again? We are not for a second encouraging COVID to come back as sweet left. At the same time, 2022 marks the 20th anniversary of the very first Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture, inaugurated by Madiba and delivered by President Bill Clinton. The Nelson Mandela Foundation and the world we work in have followed winding and sometimes scary paths since then, bringing us finally 
to an annual lecture in KwaZulu-Natal for the first time. What an honor it is to be here in Durban, hosted by the provincial government and supported by our headline sponsor and longtime institutional partner and friend, Old Musho. You don't know how important that clap was because Mureki, you clap when I call Mureki. <laughs> there are so many I must thank for making today possible, but that I will do in a vote of thanks right at the end of proceedings. In recent years, the Nelson Mandela Foundation has visited or passed through Durban numerous times. We love this city, but sadly, it hasn't all, only always been the love that brought us to this uh, city. It has been mainly need, sometimes desperate need. We have supported a number of Mandela Day campaign projects. We brought each one feed one here to bring emergency food and other supplies as a COVID lockdown hit com communities very hard. We were back after a wave of public violence here in July 2021 and subsequently undertook a six-month research project to understand the underlying causes of that violence. And we were back here again earlier this year when devastating floods took so many lives and ruined so many communities. We've dedicated the 20th Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture to the people of KwaZulu-Natal and are here in solidarity, especially with those who are feeling most directly the impact of climate change. The chair of our board of trustees, Professor Njabulon Debele, will say more about this dimension in a moment. Today will be an extraordinary mix of reflection, analysis, calls to action, and entertainment. It gives me great pleasure now to invite to the stage the Drakensberg Boys Choir. They will be delivering the national anthem in a moment. Now it gives me singular pleasure to welcome on the stage our guest and uh, speakers, uh, our guest speaker mainly. I'd like to call on stage the chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Nelson Mandela Foundation, Professor Njabulo Ndebele. Welcome, Prof. I'd like to call the Premier of KwaZulu Natal, Me Nomusa Dube Ngube. Welcome, Premier. To now call uh, Megrasa Marshall. I know oh, there's uh, uh, Zulveli just uh, acknowledging who no sees. I'd like to now, you know who's coming next, uh, but uh, you want me to say it, right? Um, she has really inspired us. Prof and I had an honor uh, to meet her in uh, New York recently, and uh, she was so looking forward to addressing you today that every day that we've been spent with this, spending with her, she's been dying to just be on the stage. So please help me welcome the Honorable Prime Minister, Mayor Amor Motley.
Prime Minister, I think the pressure is very high. They gave you a standing ovation before you speak. Um, so uh, they didn't believe us when we said you were coming. So thank you for honoring this invitation. Um, while you're standing, we'd like to now call on the Drakensberg Boys Choir to please give us the national anthem. proceedings and while you're standing I'm going to ask that everybody here to stand with me and observe a minute's silence for those who died in the floods here in this Durban area this year. May we acknowledge that extreme weather related to climate change is something we simply have to reckon with. It used to be something we thought was coming. It's now here with us and we may determine that this loss of life will never be forgotten nor be in vain. Thank you very much. You may be seated. I'd like to invite to the podium someone who mentored me to be the CEO that I am today, Professor Njabulon Debele, the chairman of our board of trustees, to welcome you formally here, but also the audiences following the proceedings through radio, and television broadcasts and on other various online platforms. Prof has been a great mentor and leader of the foundation and has served the legacy of Madiba with distinction for much longer. Thank you very much, Prof. Distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Nelson Mandela Foundation's Board of Trustees, I thank you truly for attending the 20th Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture. Many individual expressions of thanks for making today possible are due and they will be conveyed by our chief executive in his closing remarks. 
but just two from me at the outset. The government of Barbados has been such a pleasure to work with in bringing its Prime Minister to deliver this lecture. And we are grateful to the province of KwaZulu-Natal for hosting this lecture for the very first time. <clears throat> Thank you, Premier Dube Ngube. We wanted to be in the province at this moment after having done a lot of relief work here, both in the wake of the floods earlier this year and the wave of public violence in the previous year. These, of course, are not isolated, unconnected phenomena. The, very, the voraciousness of global capital both condemns populations and the global south to destitution and to the ever-growing exposure to extreme weather conditions in what could be called climate just, ju injustice. The global struggle for justice continues. South African struggles for liberation through the colonial and apartheid eras have always placed the land at the center of desire and purpose. We cannot understand past and present discourses without pursuing and pursuing more movements of, of freedom without understanding the spiritual, cultural, and political importance of the land. So it is that many of our songs and our slogans speak to this very issue. The lamentation Tina Sizwe Esimnyama expresses the pain of being separated from our land and longing to return. Israel too Africa. They all speak to the same issue. And climate justice is enabling us to understand that any returning of the land must also mean the return of healthy and prosperous ecosystems and environments that are able to support human and other life forms. It means communities being able to live in harmony with the needs of the land and the calling of their ancestors. It means the end of extractive mining practices that place the safety and well-being of communities at risk. The end of toxic dumping in vulnerable religions regions, the end of the profoundly extractive relationships between the global north and the global south. What I am naming here, I believe, is what our speaker today, the Honorable Prime Minister, Mia Motley, has called processes of decolonization. Increasingly, we in the global south and thanks to the powerful voices like that of Prime Minister Motley, are beginning to understand the connections between climate justice and decolonization. For too long here in the South, in South Africa, we have not only not seen the connections, but have regarded them as almost competing with one another. This is a distraction we can no longer afford. The struggle for decolonization cannot be separated from the struggle for decolonization, cannot be separated from the struggle 
for climate justice. For centuries, European colonialism took control of the global south, extracting from its peoples, its cultures, trades, and crafts, such as resources such as rubber, coffee, tertulum, gold, and most relevantly, oil and gas, and I need add today the local, the latest uh, cobalt. Slavery and colonialism contributed critically to the emergence of the Industrial Revolution in Europe and later in North America. And thus began the release of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere in volumes that were unimaginable. What followed has left the global south with climate resilient ecosystems and, in, in, and environments, which in turn makes it particularly vulnerable to climate disasters such as droughts, typhoons, floods, and heavy wind, to name a few. And here we in Deben today, uh, which we are now we now know is becoming increasingly vulnerable in exactly this kind of way that only a few days ago we had another flooding uh, in this part of, of, uh, of, of South Africa. The climate change is disproportionately devastating countries in the global south. And that fact is no longer a question. In making 2019 cyclone I, I, sorry, in March 2019, Cyclone Idai took the lives of more than a thousand people across Zimbabwe, Malawi, and Mozambique, and devastated millions who are left destitute without basic food or services. And over the last year, deadly floods and landslides have forced 12 million people from their homes across the globe in India, Nepal, and Bangladesh. And scientists say that the region's monsoon rains are being intensified by rising sea surface temperatures in South Asia. Rising sea levels, warming temperatures, deforestation, and more frequent and extreme weather events place the Caribbean at high risk to the point where coastal communities and entire islands could potentially disappear. I could go on. There are just three examples that I have given of a growing global phenomenon. It is time for justice climate this is to say that our response to climate change must take into consideration the ways in which that change is a social crisis that affects different people in different ways and is further intensifying existing forms of injustice and inequity. So climate justice is about understanding that the global north carries special responsibilities for changing its behaviors and finding sustainable and respectable and respectful solutions that are truly global. Climate justice is about refusing to allow the global south to become a climate sacrifice zone while countries of the global north use their resources to fortify and protect themselves. It is time for we countries of the global south to understand that the struggle for decolonization is far from over. And we have to find ways of exposing and combating still very voraciously extractive global capital. And if we are to do so, then we have to find our own agency. We have to begin using the leverage that we do have 
consistently, and, but do not always use. And we have to find the vision for such a struggle. We need a vision indeed. And we need voices that articulate that vision like that of Prime Minister Motley. And thank you very much for that. Thank you very much, Prof, for giving these insights into key lines of inquiry for the 20th Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture. I must say, Prof, this audience let you down. You give them two slogans, and they don't respond. So please help me that uh, Prof needs to feel that you know these slogans. When he said, is to I mean, really. <laughs> Prof, shall I try again? Is Oletu. Maibu ye. Manikongwe. Yeah, now we sound like we're here um, in the province of KZN. Thank you very much. I'd like to now invite to the uh, podium the Premier of the province of KwaZulu Natal, Me Nomosa Dube Ngube. Premier, it's been a pleasure working with you and your team. Please, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Program Director. I wish to acknowledge in the room the Prime Minister of Barbados, Honorable Mia Motley. I wish to acknowledge the presence of the patron of the Nelson Mandela Foundation, Mrs. Grash Marshall, the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade, Honorable Simons, the former Deputy President of the Republic of South Africa, Honorable Mlambo Nunga. I also wish to acknowledge the Chief Zweli Velile, Mandela, and the whole family of Mandela that are present here today. The board of Nelson Mandela Foundation, Professor Ndebele, the CEO of Nelson Mandela Foundation, Mr. Hatang, the chairperson of the board, and all other um, delegations of the old mutual group. I also do wish to acknowledge all the members of the Executive Council, the ministers that are present, deputy ministers, the members from the civil society, the business uh, that is present here, the councillors, the mayors, um, and all our international guests, and all of you, um, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Anybody else? Um, program director, allow me to open um, by recognizing our, in our midst the presence of the Honorable Prime Minister of Barbados, Her Excellency Mia Motley, who this afternoon will deliver the 20th Annual Nelson Mandela Lecture. Your Excellency, we are really honored for having to be graced by you and that you have found time to be with us on this historic occasion, which is the first time, as Professor has said, it's the first time that is being held here in Guazulu Natal in person following um, the COVID-19 pandemic since um, 2020. Um, now you will agree with me that um, KwaZulu Natal is a province of the first. Everything starts here. The first premier, the first minister, prime minister, the first, the first, the first. <clears throat> I 
We have in those um, hallowed walls of Inkos, the Albert Lutuli Convention Center, the first female uh, Prime Minister of Barbados. She has taken power that God and voters have placed in her hands, not only to transform the people of the Caribbean, but to champion the international cause of climate change in order to save humanity. And in that vein, the people of KwaZulu Natal. We also wish to express our sincere gratitude to the Nelson Mandela Foundation for honoring our people in such a humbling and uplifting manner as we rise to leave the challenges and the devastation of floods that took place this year in April and May. To bring the annual lecture here, the 20th in KwaZulu Natal, is to give hope to our people of our province and to recognize the special place that Madiba himself had in his heart to KwaZulu Natal. Every corner of our province is dotted with Madiba's footprints. This is not only where the founding president of a democratic South Africa was arrested on the 5th of August 1962 at what is now called the Mandela capture site in Hawick. This is also where Madiba delivered his last speech before he was captured as a free man under apartheid. That meeting was in the All Africa Conference that was held in 1961 at Manai Hall in Imbali Township in Peter Maritzburg. Madiba was later incarcerated to what would become a 27 years in prison. President Mandela writes with fondness about his many trips to Natal, to the then Natal, where he interacted with the President of the African National Congress in Kosi, Chief Albert Lutuli, and many other leaders of the Congress movement. It is these intimate discussions that left to the formation of Mkonto Wesizwe, the armed wing of the ANC, and the adoption of the armed struggle that changed the trajectory of our struggle to liberation. It was to Guazulu Natal that Madiba returned to cast his first vote in a democratic South Africa on the 27th of April, 1994. At this historic um, Otlang Institute, which is a brainchild of the ANC president, Dr. Langalibalele Dube. And before Madiba casting his vote, he famously went to Dr. Dube's grave to report that South Africa is now free. Therefore, we are honored to gather here in Madiba's name to remember his role as a global icon in the fight for justice and a better life, especially for the oppressed and the downtrodden of our world. It is no coincidence that Madiba is reported to have once said, and I quote, I dream of our vast deserts, of our forests, of all our great wilderness. We must never forget that it is our duty to protect this environment. So ladies and gentlemen, this annual lecture is being held at the right place at the right time, seven months after the devastating floods that hit mainly the coastal areas, resulting in massive loss of lives and the destruction of infrastructure. We are beaten and battered by the recent events that have also spared us working together with all the stakeholders and business, civil society, to resist and to rise again to the occasion. Rebuilding must also take into consideration not only to bleed, people must not build in our floodlines, floodplains, or dry river banks, which may erupt during uh, flash floods. If we work together, we can save lives and not only speak of recovery and rebuilding. Ladies and gentlemen, many perhaps say KwaZulu Natal is a small uh, province by nature, seeking to punch above its weight by wanting to lead uh, fellow Africans to the medium-term goal of improving climate action in the continent 
Today, yes, we say yes we can because we have learned from Madiba and the Prime Minister that with leadership of a country like South Africa, we can indeed become the center of human rights struggle internationally. We can indeed because the leadership of Prime Minister Motley, the islands of the country of Barbados, has indeed become a mobilizing, conscientizing, and authoritative force for reason and persuasion in the fate of the climate change. We welcome all our visitors to this beautiful province. This is all your home, the home of all colors of our rainbow nation. We welcome you to the land of Dr. Langalibalele Dube, to the land of Fatima Mia, to the land of Mahatma Gandhi, to the land of the Big Five and the Drakensberg Mountain in Dabazo Kathlamba, to the land of Isimangaliso wetlands, the warm sandy beaches, and the gorgeous warm weather. We look forward to welcome you back again as you come back to rest in the near future and find time to visit some of those wonderful places and beautiful province as your permanent home. Thank you, Program Director. Thank you very much, uh, Premier. Um, I'm sure they will be back because we keep coming back to this province, so um, it is indeed beautiful. Thank you very much, Premier. And now, ladies and gentlemen, there's one more protocol uh, uh, before we, we then get to hear from the Prime Minister. Uh, I'm going to ask Prof. Njabul Ndebele to come back, but before he does that, we have in our midst a very special guest. Um, the guest who uh, the Prime Minister ran a competition for all the children of Barbados to write an essay about Nelson Mandela. And uh, the, the secondary school children wrote in, and of course there's one winner. And that winner is sitting here with mom. I'd like you to please give her a rousing, rousing applause. Her name is Woleta. They, they didn't see you, so I'd like you to please stand up one more time. Her name is Woleta Israel Yaakov. And she is with mommy. Uh, her mom is uh, Hureta Selassie Yaakov. <laughs> Prof, uh, mom told me that, uh, th that uh, she used to to also write letters to the UN when Madiba was uh, incarcerated. So every other month, as children of Barbados, they were encouraged to write letters to the UN to say Madiba should be freed. So your struggle has been realized. Over to you, Prof. Well, as we getting closer and closer to the special event, it is uh, my singular privilege to say a few more words about our distinguished speaker. You have heard the context which informed the decision to invite the Honorable Mayor Motley to deliver the 20th Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture. Her voice is a powerful and important one, and we are honored to have her with us for this 20th lecture. I first met her recently, as Silo has mentioned, on a trip to New York, where she hosted Silo and I in the background to the United Nations Annual General Assembly. We left with very pleasant memories of her warmth and the generous intensity of her engagement with us. I cannot wait to hear her lecture today. 
In 2018, she became the first woman to become the Prime Minister of Barbados. An attorney at law and Queen's Counsel, Prime Minister Motley has been active in the political life of Barbados for almost three decades. She has served as the chair of the Conference of Heads of Government of the Caribbean Community and as co-chair of the Development Committee of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund and also as co-chair of the World Health Organization's Global Leaders Group on Antimicrobial Resistance. And very, very recently, the United Nations 2022 Champion for Global Change Award was given to her. Well, I could go on and on, but uh, the, prim, the Prime Minister will forgive me that it is hardly necessary to read her CV uh, tonight. But without any further ado, it is my great pleasure to welcome her warmly to this esteemed Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture Platform. And ladies and gentlemen, please join me in offering her this welcome. I need to see you. <laughs> Good afternoon. Mrs. Gracia Michelle, or shall I say Mama Gracia? Premier. So I feel as though I know you already. Leaders of government, all. Members of the Mandela family. Members of the Zuma family. My friend who last hosted me 20 years ago on my last trip to South Africa, Mr. Trevor Emmanuel and his wife. Can I just simply say prof now? <laughs> and of course, the other members of the Board of Trustees of the Nelson Mandela Foundation and Salo, I can call you that in front of everyone now too. Some may say that it is because I haven't quite been able to get the... And if they say so, they're correct. But let me say good afternoon to all of you and to say truly what a distinct honor and privilege it is to be here today. I want to salute our very own young Barbadian student, Oleta, who stood earlier and her mother. You will forgive me if I feel a little old because her mother was in school with me. It is a recognition of the passage of years. But let me start by saying how honored I am 
this afternoon. I truly consider this one of the privileges of my life. And I say so with all humility because there are few people who I believe have stood out as a moral colossus on the global landscape. And Nelson Mandela stood as one of those men. The truth is that I'm distinctly honored as well to be here in KwaZulu-Natal. The Premier has already laid out why this location today is also special. Special for her as the first Premier of this province. Special for me as the first first female premier of this province, I should say. Special for me as the first woman leader of Barbados. Special because in a very real way, this marked the red line in the sand given the arrest of Nelson Mandela in this province. But special also because it is the home of Mahatma Gandhi, who is easily, equally, in that pantheon of global heroes who have inspired us to a higher and better purpose in all that we do. I do not believe that anything is therefore by accident. And then, to that extent, I do not believe therefore that the message is inappropriate, ill-placed, or ill-timed. For to be here, in this place, at this time, to speak to this matter of justice and solidarity is, in my view, one of those things that can perhaps be viewed as preordained. The battles have been long. The battles have been strong. And one of the things that I've come here today first to have discussion. It's a lot of, as I would say in Barbados, a lot of long talk, a lot of long words in the title. But what we've really come here to talk about this afternoon is justice, fair play, and solidarity. People who don't normally have the power on their own working together and making that difference. Doing so in the context of calling upon us to summon that will for moral strategic leadership in really what will become not just the battle of our lifetime, but the battle of planet Earth. My friends, I must tell you that I come here today not as a singular Caribbean person dropping from the sky, but as one who comes after the efforts of many across the decades. And it may be useful for me to place context to that struggle to make two points before I get into the meat of what I want to speak with you. And that is to be able to contextualize that in my own country, from the father of democracy, Grantly Herbert Adams, in his early days, both as Premier of Barbados and then as Prime Minister of the West Indies Federation, and to those countries who took action in 1959, July, after the All Africa December 1958 Congress in Accra, Ghana, where Barbados, Jamaica, Grenada, and Dominica took action to ban South African goods in solidarity with the people of South Africa. <laughs> Recognizing that though they were thousands of miles away, there was an injustice being perpetrated. Man's inhumanity to man that required people who had little power to take a stand and to say wrong is wrong. And their efforts were soon followed 
months later in April of 1960 in our sister island in Trinidad and Tobago where the dock workers of Trinidad refuse to take the cargo from South Africa off the ships of April, in April of 1960 and refuse to refuel <laughs> refuel the ship that had brought the cargo recognizing that even though they were dock workers and not capable of great and grave decisions they could do what they could within the space that they could and their work was to be followed then of course by that titan of Caribbean revolution and social reform Fidel Castro El Comandante who worked then with that other great Caribbean titan Michael Manley of Jamaica well known perhaps to many of you and of course our own father of independence Errol Walton Barrow who worked with Fidel Castro in the struggle for the liberation of the peoples of southern Africa by allowing the planes that left Havana Cuba to refuel in Bridgetown Barbados in order to bring the troops in to south southern Africa and in particular southwestern Africa and then of course there was the decision of the Commonwealth heads of government and I remember as a young law student in London caught up in the fervor of the anti-apartheid movement and caught up in the passion of wanting to see your own imagery on television because in those days you just didn't and when we saw the students of South Africa week after week rise up to take their future into their own hands it placed the pressure on leaders like Margaret Thatcher and others such that by the time the Commonwealth heads of government meeting went to Nassau Bahamas a determination was made to establish the eminent persons group and in that eminent persons group co-chaired by Malcolm Fraser of Australia and Chief Obasanyo of Nigeria it also included a woman who was to become the first Governor General of Barbados Dame Nita Barrow who came here as one of the seven persons to determine whether there could be a platform for talks and for release in order to ensure that the ungodly and unconscionable actions of apartheid could be brought to an end. Regrettably, their work was to be stymied by the then government, but they were capable and able at the time to meet Madiba. And it is instructive what they wrote in their unanimous report about Madiba in 1986. And I quote, having visited him on three occasions, what was their assessment? That he impressed us as an outstandingly able and sincere person whose quality of leadership were self-evident. We found him unmarked by any trace of bitterness despite his long imprisonment his overriding concern was for the welfare of all races in South Africa in a just society he longed to be allowed to contribute to the process of reconciliation this was not post release this was not on the eve of release this was still deep in the bowels of his imprisonment and you know I've deliberately decided to take a segue this afternoon before addressing the fundamental issues because it is important that we contextualize the struggle and the values for those who refuse to be reminded 
or who fail to be reminded or who are not reminded may well believe that this was as easy as dealing with the twinkle of an eye with the remediation and reparation of an awful thing. It hurt me to hear that there are some who believe that Madiba did not do enough. And perhaps worse for a few that he might have been a sellout. All because what they believe, justifiably so, should be theirs today is not yet theirs. I've deliberately started this conversation this evening by carrying you back to the 1950s and stopping in the 1980s and stopping again in the 1990s because if there is any one single truth it is that each of us runs our leg of the relay and the baton is all that can be required of us to carry and yesterday I had the distinct honor of going to the foundation's headquarters in the center of memory and of reading and I feel so privileged to be given copies of the transcript in Madiba's own handwriting and I shall treasure them as long as I have breath but in reading his own assessment of where he was and what he believed had happened in what was to become the beginning of chapter one of the presidential years it was ironic that he started with the words men and women all over the world right down the centuries come and go men and women all over the world right down the centuries come and go what is more significant for me is that as he ended that first chapter he also reflected on the fact that he sought at no stage for the fame that was to follow him and that the notion that he could be regarded as a saint was one that he thoroughly rejected and the last words I never was one even on the basis of an earthly definition of a saint as a sinner who keeps trying my friends, we need to pause sometimes and to remember context always. And I do so because in a very real sense, that which I've come to address you today on to is the subject of a great struggle and will be the subject of a struggle that will require many different people to run their different legs of the baton, of the race to hand over the baton. And the example of Madiba is the example more than any other that I would want us to hold on to because in so doing it is the values that he exhibited. The moral example, the moral compass that he provides that gives us both the strength and the capacity to run this race which will be the greatest race that humanity will require of any generation. It stands out for me that at the very outset courage was never lacking. 
It is a cause for which I am prepared to fight, but a cause for which I am prepared to die. How many of us can say that today? It was the moral fortitude of a man that determined that no type of offer with special conditionalities for early freedom would be acceptable because what was required was justice. It is amazing that in the face of the gravest and greatest inhumanity, not just to himself, to his family, to his people, that the vengeance that would otherwise eat and force others into action was absent from his mind, body, and spirit. And as I just read to you from the evidence of the eminent persons group, not conveniently so as an act of politics, but as an act of character deep in the bosom of his imprisonment. And then there's the story that was told to me yesterday by Cello as we looked at the photographs of what his cell contained. And I well recall my own visit to Robin Island 20 years ago. And all who, like me, have practiced a little criminal law in my career know that that is a common sight in colonial constructed prisons that had no sanitary facilities. And the humility of the man captured best in being able to ensure that he when one of his own brothers was unable to take care of themselves in the most basic and human of ways that Madiba performed the duties of cleaning for him. An example of servant leadership, if ever there is one. So forgive me if I have strayed a bit because I believe that in this world where everything is instantaneous and quick and where people expect results like that, we sometimes need to remind ourselves of the context of the struggles that we fight and to remind ourselves of what truly, truly was at stake. There are some young people who would simply now, three decades after his release, will only know of Nelson Mandela in the context of a history book or in the stories told by others, but would not appreciate what it is to be prevented from being able to love who you want, to work where you want, to live where you want, to do what you want in ways that are simply not capable of contemplation today. But we can't talk about economic justice and economic opportunity if the basic aspects of freedom have not been guaranteed. No one expects us to be stuck in a moment of time but it is the understanding that he did what was his to do. It is now up to us to do what is ours to do. And it is for that reason I've come to KwaZulu-Natal. You know, we live in a world that is at a very strange moment in time. It has been described recently as a polycrisis. And it has been so described because as soon as you get accustomed to managing one crisis, you've been hit with another one and another one and another one. 
And that is what it has felt like in the last few years. This country already knows what it is to lose people to the ravages of a public health crisis as you did with HIV and AIDS for so long. Then to have to face, like the rest of us, the awful pandemic of COVID-19, taken away so many, all of us know people who have died in the last few years. None of us dreamt of a moment when our movement would be restricted so such that we couldn't do the things that we wanted to do. And this was not being imposed on us by authoritarian governments. This was being imposed by public health specialists for the safety and survival of all of us. And as if that were not enough, because we were already fighting the climate crisis, we were still recovering from the financial crisis of 2008-9. As if all of that was not enough, then comes the awful scourge of the cancer of inflation, the cancer of the cost of living. And believe you me, it is a cancer because you keep trying to run after it and run after it, but you can't catch up with it in that way. And we have now to come to understand that as much as we needed to mobilize to fight against vaccine inequity, that we were not a one issue country or a one issue people, that we literally had to fight these multiple crises because as all of this is happening, people were still dying from the climate crisis. I don't talk about the climate change. Change happened a long time ago. Crisis is where we are and crisis is what we have to fight. And today, I want us to recognize that what is required of us is going to have to allow us to one, develop partnerships in places where we may never have dreamt of so doing before and to be able to do things in new ways that we had never thought of doing and that the actions required are not simply those of others but of us because it is the collective action that has led the world to be where it is today. There is no doubt that those primarily responsible for the increase in greenhouse gas emissions are the G20 countries for whom 80% of the responsibility is there. Within that context, the traditional colonial powers who benefited from the Industrial Revolution through our blood, our sweat, and our tears, have been the ones who have effectively put the world in this position of warming. Theirs is the stock of gases. But then there are those who continue today, for which there are many of us. No name, no blame, because it's all of us. And it is the combined effect of the stock primarily, but yes, the flow today that continues to cause the problems. I want us to reflect on the principles of justice and solidarity and on the moral compass that Madiba provided for us to understand that what requires is required of us is to be able to deconstruct and to reconstruct much of what we do. We have come to a stage where the evidence of the science is palpable. I didn't know when I accepted to do this speech that you, the people of KwaZulu-Natal, would have in this week of our Lord this year suffered additional damage. The second river breaking its banks in less than six months. The first one causing loss of life and damage. This one continuing the loss of damage. 
We speak in the shadow of Sharm el Sheikh. A conference of the parties intended to see progress and action. Progress, I fear, not fast enough, but still yet there. But it is up to ordinary people to begin to place the pressure and to begin to participate in the advocacy that is going to make the difference. And why? The consequences of the climate are now multidimensional of this crisis. I spoke just now of the loss of life. I could easily speak about the loss of livelihood. I can speak equally of the loss of dignity, the loss of shelter, the loss of family, the loss of culture, the increased number of climate migrants that we will see moving across this earth. You know, it really hit me when a former governor of the Nigerian Central Bank said to me that 80% of Southwest Nigeria is above the poverty line and 80% of Northwest Nigeria is below the poverty line. And then you start to look at the realities of what people face on this continent and what people face in the islands of the Caribbean Sea, the Indian Ocean, the Pacific Sea. And we begin to understand that what is at stake now is real poor people. Nobody believed that the people of Montserrat would ever have to leave their island because of a volcanic eruption. And the notion that climate refugees is something for others somewhere else is now proven to be a fiction. It is real and it is with us. And you here in this province have seen evidence of it this week and in my own region last weekend in St. Lucia the people of St. Lucia felt the ravages of the floods there not the hurricane, the floods in Belize City a few days before it was the hurricane how many more hurricanes how many more floods how many more people suffering from drought as is happening in Kenya will the world endure and have to endure before action is taken the difficulty is and this is where the complexity of the conversation enters is that it is not simply the commitments made on stage now that matter but it is the capacity to deliver on those commitments. In my own country, we have recognized that we needed to do our part. And I have repeated over and over that in making those determinations, we said, use electric cars, we'll give you a tax holiday. Two years, we can't get the electric cars to buy. We said, let every owner of their own house be entitled to have, as of right, photovoltaic panels, two and a half, five, ten kilowatts, depending on the size of the house. Can't get the batteries to deal with the storage necessary to allow these persons to do it. And that is why this week in Sharm el Sheikh I called not just simply for capacity to match commitment but also for us to ensure that we have a just industrialization you see the global south has for too long been the place from which wealth has been extracted and for which there has been no determination to put back in to the south the resources necessary to move from primary materials to finish product and if you're like us in the Caribbean where you're small you are not only price takers you have to hope you can get access to the product the pandemic taught us that 
with vaccines, with ventilators, with other therapeutics. Because you're just too small to anyone to notice you. And once there is global pressure on, there will be winners and losers. And small states count among the losers in those circumstances. Regrettably, we have come to a point where the necessary capacity to make the just transition, a phrase that you know well here in South Africa, the just energy transition is no longer within our power alone. And it therefore means that we are likely to see more innocent victims because the reality between our capacity to manage that transition and to see it happen is just simply not there. I hope that with the granular discussions taking place that we can see more activity. But the reality equally is this, that it costs money to bring about industrialization. And even when the global north seems to want to help us in the south, the cost of so doing has been made so prohibitive by an unfair financial system that it is almost impossible to achieve with the level of returns that are acceptable. And you know this better than I do in South Africa. In the global north, people will borrow at anywhere between 1% to 4%. In the south, you're struggling 12 and 14% in today's environment. When those costs are put into the business plan, the rates of return from the project all of a sudden just don't look attractive enough. And you ask yourself, why is there that disparity in the cost of borrowing? Why is there that disparity in the treatment of our peoples? Why is it that during the emerging market crisis, the international financial institutions promoted a constant prescription of currency devaluation and higher interest rates and fiscal austerity and an end to public bailouts. And there were sharp contractions and increases in poverty we saw in the nations who were so affected. But when their countries became the subject of the crisis, all of a sudden, the prescription was different. No devaluation, zero interest rates, fiscal expansion, Massive bailouts. You only need to recall what happened in 2008. You don't have to go much further. In fact, the fact that we are seeing interest rates rise from zero tells you and reminds you of where it went because of the last crisis. The disparity in treatment, regrettably, is one of the remaining consequences of the colonial order. And we in the South have to determine whether we will continue to be victims of a process that was supposed to have been dismantled in the post-World War II era with your own country coming almost 50 years after because of the apartheid system. It is simply not good enough. And we have therefore to change the discourse, not just to climate alone, but to the financial system that is underpinning and preventing us from being architects and craftsmen of our own destiny, rather than simply awaiting the handouts from others in the global north. You know, I would much rather <laughs> that I could be here talking other things today because then we would have a fuller conversation. But the truth is that it is that injustice and that discriminatory treatment at the core of the financial system, in my view, that continues to limit the promise of political independence and decolonization that was promised to us.
Those who expect more of Madiba expect more because their own personal financial and economic circumstances have not moved with the pace that they might otherwise have accepted or expected. And it is for that reason that I believe that if ever there was a moment in time for the global south to rally around a cause, it is now. There are at least 50 countries who stand on the verge of a debt crisis as we speak today. It does not give me any comfort to say that the worst may yet still be before us. And I say so because one of the things that is necessary for those same younger people who wonder about Madiba's role is that the first thing we need to do is to moderate expectations and to bring context and reality to all that we do in today's world in this moment of a poly crisis. I spoke already about the inflation. I have not yet spoken, but perhaps should, about the sustainable development goals, which is just simply our desire to have a better life. And those are being frozen as the numbers who are going back into poverty increase, as the numbers who face food insecurity increase. And at the core of it, I submit to you, are a few things that we need to do differently. One, yes, the reform of the financial system, and I'll come back to that in what we call the Bridgetown Initiative. But two, I want to speak to us, because we need to treat to government and governance differently. And we need to appreciate that if we treated to the pandemic purely as a government solution, most of us probably would never have succeeded. But it was the national effort to fight those battles that have allowed us to come out today in far better shape than we were and that we were expected to be in when we went in. And the partnerships now between citizen, community, and country, the ability for those of us who are above the poverty line to give back and to give of ourselves in the spirit of Madiba. <laughs> to recognize that it is not to government alone that this charge must fall. And that our ability to help people through the cost of living crisis is within our capacity in a way that the climate crisis is not immediately within our capacity. But we need to be strong to fight the climate crisis. And if we don't fight the cost of living crisis as we fought the pandemic, we will be that much weaker in being able to emerge successful and resilient from the climate crisis. I ask us to ponder on these things because too often in today's world, there is the determination that let us look to someone else and look at someone else for the solution. When in truth and in fact, our capacity and capability of working together can make the difference between whether someone sleeps easy at night, whether someone eats during the day, whether someone has access to shelter. And I do hope that that when combined, yes, with the monetary measures that must be put in place, quantitative tightening, increasing interest rates, suppressing demand, bringing about hardship in order to be able to make the, the, the patient better. Where I come from, I don't know whether you had a cough medicine here called Buckley's, but we had one in Barbados called Buckley's. It tastes bad, but it works. <laughs> and that was what your parents would tell you every day. It tastes bad, but it works. And regrettably, to control the, the cancer cost of living, it is going to require some suppression of what we do in order to tame the prices back down so that your salaries don't evaporate in the air. But these conversations cannot be captured in 60 seconds, sound bites, or four inch columns. 
And therefore, we inhibit ourselves from being able to be successful in solving these problems because we don't have the difficult conversations with each other globally anymore because we are into a world of narrow casting, we are into a world of social media, we are into a world where we do our own thing in our own way when we want without reference to whether that will allow us to sustain the journey. Could you imagine if that was the approach of Madiba where you would be standing in South Africa today? Could you imagine if that were the approach of those others who fought, who fought, like Walter Sisulu and Oliver Tambo and all of the others, where would you be today? But even when we get rid of that cost of living issue, the other reason why we need to reform the financial system is because we actually do need money to invest in human development. <laughs> We're not a one crisis or a one issue person. Even if we think we're only doing it for climate, the reality is, as I said in Sharm El Sheikh this week, we cannot depend on the financing of education and healthcare with seven year money and 10 year money anymore because it simply will not allow us to provide the best possible education to our children who, quite frankly, deserve it. And if there was anything that I could wish for globally, it would be a global minimum floor for the provision of education and health care to all citizens under the age of 18 years old. That's why we are human beings. We don't come on this earth just to individually prosper and see others suffer. And you here know it more than most because of your struggles. And if we can therefore ensure that if we can borrow at reasonable rates of interest, the savings in the interest will finance many of the social programs that now go lacking in our societies because of an unfair financial system. I'm not talking about yesterday when the debt crisis has gotten worse. But two years ago, Greece and Ghana same credit rating, but Greece borrowing at a fraction of what the government of Ghana could borrow on the international capital markets. For what reason? Because one is in Africa and one is in Europe? Geography? I do know about the safe assets, yes. But the safe assets are a construct of the international financial architecture that does not see us, does not hear us, and does not feel us. And that is why we have asked more and over and over that if you can, one, meet the immediate needs of the crisis by providing liquidity to those countries that most need it, to allow them to stop the bleeding. That's effectively what they're doing, stopping the bleeding. You can't operate on the patient while the patient is bleeding out. And thank God, the International Monetary Fund has the leadership that it does today because without Kristalina Gorgiva's leadership, God knows what would have happened to so many countries if the rapid um, credit facility had not been there in 2020 when the pandemic first started. But the problem is that that was for the pandemic starting. And I described a polycrisis which means that the need for additional liquidity is still there. And it begs the question whether there ought not to be a different approach to these issues, allowing, for example, a standard liquidity drawdown that will immediately stop the bleeding without questions, without conditionalities, because if the bleeding, if the bleeding continues, the financial crisis will eat in to our pockets, our bank accounts, our savings, our stability. That is what is at risk. And that is what happened a hundred years ago with the Great Depression. And God forbid that it should be our future and not just simply an example of our history. Similarly, 
We believe that it is important that the multilateral development banks and the World Bank, otherwise known as its proper name, the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, needs to exercise greater risk appetite and to step up to the plate where it has not been sufficiently found during this polycrisis moment. Our countries cannot do it alone. And I don't say so with any rancid tone in my voice. I say so more as a plea now at this stage. The International Bank for Reconstruction and Development of the 20th Century, with the crises of the 20th century, cannot be the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development of the third decade of the 21st century when the crises are different. You may ask why I'm spending so much time on these issues. Because these are the issues that will determine whether we can provide more financing for education to ensure that we can reduce the level of crime in our societies. Whether we can provide more financing so that we can provide health care to those who truly deserve it and who therefore can boost their immune systems such that they are not vulnerable to the next pandemic whenever it comes unnecessarily so. As we learned with the last pandemic, that it was the comorbidities that took out the weakest from among us. These are the unsexy things that some may have wanted Madiba to solve in five years, but require us to solve in a few decades. And then there's the other unsexy issue of special drawing rights. Because when we ask the multilateral development banks to expand their lending to us at concessional rates, we realize that yes, they can, as the capital adequacy framework recommends from the G20 countries, they can sweat their balance sheets a little more. But in addition to that, they probably will need the benefit of the special drawing rights to be able to expand their lending significantly as well. And as they do that, we ask them to remember that 70% of the world's poor do not live actually in low-income countries. They don't live in poor countries. 70% of the world's poor live in middle-income countries. And when you exclude middle-income countries from being able to borrow, you are effectively condemning the poor in middle-income countries to remain in, in poverty for the rest of their lives and to <laughs> cement an intergenerational poverty. That is what we fight for. The notion that Barbados, Bahamas, and the Maldives cannot borrow as a right from the World Bank in today's world in a climate crisis is so preposterous that it tells us that we need to reset and recalibrate urgently if we are to prepare for fighting these battles. My friends, you know, those last two things, or three things that I spoke about, are part of the Bridgetown Initiative. I've tried to break them down into simple terms, because it is important that the energy comes from you as well, to be able to say that this is a battle that must be won. Apartheid remained when it was the province of those in diplomatic arena and politically charged rooms, cloistered, even the UN. But when the children of this country determined that they were not going to be those guinea pigs to be forced into the language of Africans and took their future into their own hands, and had a level of militancy that said, not another generation, the battle changed and the conversation changed. The climate crisis is no different. And if we are to ensure that these same children and their children and their children are to live appropriately in today's world, then it is critical that this battle now be embraced at different levels. I can't imagine it would have been easy for Madiba to learn Africans, either emotionally or technically. But he did it. 
Because in mastering the language and mastering the understanding of the culture, he was able to navigate his way out of 28 years of imprisonment. I can't imagine that it is sexy for me to talk about financial reform on a Saturday afternoon in Durban when I should perhaps be out there next to the beach like the rest of the people I saw out there enjoying themselves. But if we are going to win this battle, then you need to learn what special drawing rights are. And you need to understand why it is that people in the south borrowing at rates of interest that are much, much higher than the people in the north. And you need to understand why the policy prescriptions for countries in the north when they face financial crises are different from the countries in the south. And you need to ask yourselves, what is the common thread? <laughs> Especially at a time when many, many refuse, even in the north, to acknowledge the reality of the climate crisis. It is frightening, to say the least. And that is why, even in the Bridgetown Initiative, when we talk about mitigation, we understand that as a small country, we don't have a lot of space in the Caribbean, or in Barbados, or in the wider Caribbean to mitigate. You have considerably more here in South Africa, in the continent of Africa. But our belief is that mitigation, wherever it takes place on this earth, is necessary. And that mitigation, yes, can be driven by the private sector. And yes, mitigation will more attract the language of capitalists who see returns. And there's nothing wrong with that. And we must encourage mitigation. But what we say is that the mitigation ought to be something where we create a special climate mitigation trust invest it with $5 trillion coming out once again of the SDRs, but allowing projects to bid from wherever they are on this earth, from here in KwaZulu-Natal to wherever else, to be able to help bring down the changes and the impact of the greenhouse gases. Because mitigation is valid and relevant wherever it takes place on the earth. And therefore, there should be no geographical limitations to where mitigation can take place. Now, we can't be fairer than that, because we're not asking purely that the money come to us for mitigation. We're saying, do it. Do it wherever. But what must happen is that you must do it. And regrettably, what we are still getting is the standoff. And the standoff comes because mankind is so consumed with the geopolitics of today's world that we are forgetting the reality of the planet on which we live. And it is sad because at the end of the day, time waits on no one. And the climate equally is not waiting on anyone to minimize its impact on our living and our way of life. The reality also is that justice demands that someone pay, particularly when countries who have no capacity to pay, no fiscal space, no balance sheet, cannot do so. And that is the big debate that now stands before us. Earlier this week, you may have heard me say that it is a major achievement that loss and damage has gotten finally on the agenda for conversation. Not that we've resolved it, not that we've settled the mechanism for it, but it is at least on the agenda. And I say so because it took Denmark in September and subsequently Scotland, New Zealand and Belgium in the last two weeks, however modest, establishing loss and damage funds to begin to say to the rest of the North Atlantic world, that this is an issue, this is a conversation whose time has come. And I want to put it very simply to you. Trevor, if I live next door to you, and every day I am dumping on your property, dumping on your property, and the money that you had to send to school your children, or to pay for 
medical care for your wife, all of a sudden now has to be taken up to clean up the property because you can't sleep at night, you can't eat food in peace. Then you would say that I should be sued and that I must stand responsibility for the fact that I'm causing you to spend the majority of your earnings on being able just to live. Well, private law acknowledges it. And technically, international public policy acknowledges polluter pays. But there is a fear of the developed world, the former industrial economies, I shouldn't say in the, the former, the industrial economies, the former colonizing powers, who knew how they got there, to accept liability because they believe that in accepting liability it will be open-ended. Well, as a former attorney general, I say we don't ask you for open-ended liability. But what we do ask you for is justice. And what we do ask you for is to recognize that we too accept as reasonable people that this is not a matter purely for the government or the state, but that there are non-state actors, multinational corporations whose balance sheets far exceed that of many countries in the world and whose balance sheets get there by reason of the same pollution. Who have a responsibility to pay. And I'm not into the bashing or bashing. That's not what I'm about. But the Bible talks to us about tithing. And the Quran speaks to us about giving back to those. And we simply say that if you are going to make a hundred cents in profit, two hundred billion dollars in the last quarter alone, some estimates explain that they may even reach two trillion dollars in one year in profits. Profits, then you have a responsibility to put something on the table in a loss and damage fund for those who are now having to pay out, pay out, pay out, pay out, pay out. And the oil and gas companies are not there by themselves because those who stand behind them will be the banking and the financial industry and financial sector and the insurance companies who equally profit in the same way. Now I'm using this as an example, as I've said over and over, because the world is reaching a point where global public goods is going to become the most important conversation even as we fight this climate crisis. That is what the polycrisis moment has taught us. The pandemic. If we thought COVID-19 was bad, well I'm here to tell you as co-chair of the, of, the, of the Global Health Initiative that the antimicrobial resistance the reality of your going to a doctor, a dentist for a, a, a filling of a cavity, or going to have a baby, that you are at risk of infection that could kill you now if your body no longer responds to the antibiotics because there is a resistance that has naturally been built up and the pharmaceutical industry has not brought a new antibiotic to the market in 22 years. Fact, fact, fact. Why? Because the economics of antibiotics don't compare to the economics of pharmaceuticals that treat heart condition or diabetes because you need those for life and you only need the antibiotics for a course. The economics just don't work. These are the realities and the global commons that we need in order to sustain life and livelihood and quality of life for our people will require a different approach. And therefore, the notion of non-state actors, predominantly companies, whether oil and gas, whether banking and finance, whether pharmaceutical, whether tech companies bridging the digital divide for education for young ch children, all have now to step up to the plate to provide a global fund that allows those countries who can no longer access it but through lack of, lack of fairness and lack of equity at the international level in the same way that you knew during apartheid in your own years. It is, it is regrettably a deeply colonial segmented system. Some may even argue it is global apartheid. 
And who best to provide the example of moral strategic leadership for us to win this battle than Madiba? I say to you today that we have a solemn duty, not just to look at governments, not just to look at multinational corporations, but also to bring to the table those who have large philanthropic foundations and for whom there ought now to be some form of global compact that allows them also. Many of them are doing it on their own, but perhaps we need more structure to ensure that there is a blended approach to the provision of a safe global commons for all of our people on this earth to function and to live in harmony. We are not going to get there by the twiggle of a nose. We're not going to get there in a beam me up Scotty moment as I love to say. But it is going to require the mobilization of people like yourselves. And it is to happen at a time when much else that we have come to value as standards are also being questioned. No one would ever have thought that the United States of America would take days to count votes in an election. No one would ever have thought that the United Kingdom would have had three prime ministers in less than three months. And regrettably, none of us would have ever dreamt to see war in Europe after World War II again, so soon and so tragically. Mind you, it is almost as if they've forgotten that war existed in Africa and in the Middle East for decades. The world that we have come to know has changed upon us. And we will either decide, as people of the South, to be firm craftsmen of our fate and shapers of our destiny, or we will continue to be the victims as we have been for centuries. I would much rather have come here this afternoon to speak in the tone and with the response that a Trevor Noah would be able to do on a Saturday afternoon in Durban. But regrettably, that is not my lot today. But suffice it to say that we have now to do the heavy lifting of educating our people at all levels of society and across all countries for a global movement whose time has come. It is up to us to make the bold demands, just as Madiba did, not unreasonable demands, in the same way that he restrained himself from unreasonable demands. It is up to us to also walk the higher road because those who have been the victims of discrimination must not allow themselves to be imprisoned by the actions of those who sought to discriminate before because that is a lonely and awful place to be. But what it does require of us is a fair and level playing field. And whether it is the reform of the financial system, whether it is the call for a just industrialization of the South to position us to benefit as we transition how we live and what we want to hold on to in this climate crisis, whether it is the practicality of the moment, and forgive me if I address this for a minute, because for many, there is not a recognition that a just energy transition and a 2050 net zero still accommodates elements of fossil fuel, 20% of the energy mix globally. Natural gas, the clean bridge fuel, the hydrogen, but it does mean walking away from coal. And it does mean walking away from oil. But there are opportunities.
for natural gas, and there are opportunities for hydrogen. And perhaps the opportunities for natural gas may even be a little too much for a little too long only because of the intransigence and the reluctance of others to move with the rapidity of speed that has been needed in the last decade. But the reality equally is that we cannot turn off the lights on our people tomorrow purely in the issue on the, on the basis that we are doing the right thing because people must live and people must eat. It therefore means that that contextualization also needs to be there before people say, ah, no, no gas at all either. We don't have that luxury in today's world anymore. And we lost the right to claim that luxury by governments that failed to move in the last two decades. So my friends, How do we redefine the spirit of Madiba? How do we redefine, in my own country, what we have come to call sharing the burden, but sharing the bounty? That we must all come together to fight the cause and share the burden. But remember that when the bounty is to be shared, that it is all who must share in it. That the patrimony that is ours through the sea through the wind, through the sun, has been left to us not for a few, but for all. How do we create the intergenerational responsibilities that allow us to know that it is not one generation or one man or one group of people to run the race and to leave it as if that is the end of the race? I'm reminded of the words of the Talmud, which says, we are not expected to complete the task but neither are we at liberty to resign from it. Ours is now the moment for the construction of a new global deal and a new social compact, as Antonio Guterres said to you when he addressed you on the 18th lecture in 2020. But for it to be real, it requires the energy and the activism that Barack Obama spoke of in his lecture in the 16th. And for it to be real, it requires the example, not just of Madiba, but of the people of South Africa who rose after decades of oppression and who understood that they were fighting for their culture, for their land, for their people, and who understood that if they allowed themselves to be dominated by a new and foreign culture, that what would be left of them would be so little and that it might take centuries to recreate. Today, it is up to us to recognize simply that if we don't move now, that what will be left of our planet will be inhabitable, not for us, the majority of us will make it. Regrettably, some will go, but it is your children and your children's children who will now have to find, in many places, new places to live. I hope and pray that we will take the example of Madiba and the people of South Africa in understanding what is required to win mighty battles that are necessary for good harmony with the planet and with people. And in spite of all of the odds showed to them, and all of the odds showed now to us, we can do it simply if we try. The words of Black Stalin, a Trinidadian Calypsonian, but ironically, I want to leave you with another phrase because something tells me that the spirit of the world has been awakened and that everything will be all right. Thank you.
if, if I ask them to applaud again, they will repeat it. Prime Minister, believe you me, if I tell you this is the longest applause we've had at the Nelson Mandela annual lecture. And I'm saying it uh, not because we are in KZN and I want to be safe, but it's true. <laughs> I can tell you, you are dearly loved because as you said, I want to see you. They said, oh wow, did you hear that? So that's how much you are loved. But I, I was looking at some of the comments that we got. Uh, someone said, can't she be our president just for a month? <laughs> Another commentator uh, said, uh, she's extraordinary. Malibongwe. Malibongwe. Thank you so much, Prime Minister. Wherever Madiba is, wherever Fidel Castro is, wherever Bob Marley is, they are all looking at you and they are super proud. I use those three names because when we met the Prime Minister, she said she has three heroes. It's Madiba, Fidel Castro, and Bob Marley. So, So the baton will be handed over, uh, Prime Minister, and I'm reminded of what Madiba said when, in 2008 when he said, the world remains beset by so much human suffering, poverty, and disease. It is in your hands to help build a different world. So the baton has been handed over, and we heard you. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. I want to now invite Mrs. Grassa Marshall to, to come forward and offer us both a short response and a reflection, closing remarks, as it were. Mam Grassa needs a little introduction to either local or global communities or audiences. <laughs> she, she's a tireless activist for the rights of women and children, has taken leadership positions for many years, both locally and internationally and walked hand in hand with Madiba in the last phase of his life's long walk. She has supported the annual lecture faithfully year after year since inception. Uh, and whenever I say to her, thank you, mom, she says, that's my obligation, mom. This was really the lecture of the 20th time. Mia, welcome home. Welcome home. It would have taken to be a daughter of Africa, as you quite rightly defined yourself when you were delivering the inaugural lecture to Kofi Annan. Yes, our ancestors cross the ocean where now you reside. You came home at the right time, absolutely the right time. You talked about crisis, many crises, which I don't want to repeat because I don't want to dilute. There's one crisis which you didn't mention out of uh, humility. It's the crisis of leadership. Globally, I'm talking of crisis of leadership globally. I'm so proud 
that it has to be an African child, a woman, leading what you would say is a small country, as if countries are measured according to the numbers of people or according to the dimension of its territory. But I think it's symbolic. It is an African child, a woman from a tiny country who in this global crisis of leadership, she rises. She rises and she talks to the global community, to the global community, to the human family, and say, yes, there is a crisis, or there are many crises, but I'm here, I'm ready to lead, and to tell the truth to all of us. Mia, you spoke to us. I want to start with us. You spoke to us. And you reignite our agency, our responsibility for our own future. It's not anyone else who's going to build it for us. And you reminded us that yes, as it sounded impossible to dismantle apartheid, it is these people and it is these Africans, it is the global south, then it is the global family which were able to do it. Now you are telling us, yes, we have a leader. If many of us had a doubt, we have a leader. She is our own, but she is global. So, we want to thank you because you remind us of uh, our own strengths. But we want to thank you and to tell you that from here, Yes, take the bold leadership, the courage, the deep sense of justice, the ability to make complex issues but to make them very palpable to ordinary citizens as we were able to listen this afternoon. Take this leadership. You were talking about the baton to us, but you came to take the baton from Lube, from Madiba. Yes, you'll be much more emboldened to know you carry them with you as you have to lead the global south first to be able to claim its space, its rights, but also to claim that it takes us to liberate even those who are our oppressed. So, it is symbolic that you would have to come here educate us, but it's symbolic that you came to take even more strength and the, I can't even talk about your brilliance of your mind, but to be emboldened to say these struggles of this 21st century has the Madibas but the Madibas are in the face of a woman and in the voice of a woman. Yes, 
I'm speaking also to many girls sitting here in front of us. This sister of yours is telling that yes, part of the leadership which is lacking, it is a female leadership. Female leadership. And take it from me, take it from me as your mother. Yes, the liberation struggle has the symbols, the bigger symbols, which come. Now, I may. And this one, this second liberation in which we go to, uh -uh, we need much more female faces and voices. Stand up. Be counted. Why? Because it takes the combination of the mind and the heart to articulate difficult issues, but then to make it sound so clear to everyone. We need many more meals. And you have to stand and be counted. I want to sit down because my point was not to make comments to the brilliant, brilliant lecture you have given. I decided I want to really pay tribute to you as an African and to Africans. I said I needed to emphasize that no one is small, is too small to lead and to say in that leadership you need to count in every single one of us as we did it in the past and then to articulate to make such movement that everyone will have to be shaken and everyone will have to transform everyone has to accept yes there is a possibility and that possibility, she articulated very, very clearly. So, hello, South Africa. <laughs> hello, Africa. Hello, Global South. It's time for Global South to lead. Hello. The Northern South is time to listen. And hello, human family. We only have one planet. We don't have two. And we have the ability to save it. And we were told how we can do it. Yes. Thank you, my... I usually say, thank you, my baby girl. Thank you, my baby girl. You make us so proud. But be sure, be sure, you have many of us as your soldiers. We'll be behind you. We'll learn the lessons. We'll articulate it as you do, as at our level, of course. But yes, we took the message, we listened. Yes, we will be at your side or even behind you because this is exactly the second generation of liberation we are going to. The decolonization she talked about. This new and one liberation which needs now every one of us to take responsibility and to accept another saying of Madiba. It sounds impossible. Thank you.
So uh, what you didn't hear is how Mama Shell said, uh, "Wena." You know, when an elder says "Wena," you know you are in trouble. So I'm not gonna say much. I'll just to thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Ma. If you can, please help me thank Mama Shell again. I think uh, uh, I, I, I want to repeat your words. It feels good to be African. Uh, it feels good to be in the presence of greatness, uh, being Mamea Modli. Um, and so we come to the end of the 20th Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture. Uh, I think you'll agree with me that it has been a memorable one. Incredible speakers, great reflections, and a lot of good stuff to think about into the future. You have inspired us, uh, Prime Minister, to, to keep working hard. And you have given us a powerful idea and many ideas which our teams can work as we move forward. The challenge to the board of the Nelson Mandela Foundation now is what next? There are so many people to thank for their support for this to be possible. Please bear with me as I do so. Let me thank one more time, Ms. Grassa Michelle. Mom, we are forever grateful. <clears throat> Prof, thank you so much for the leadership that you keep continue providing, and of course, to the board of the Nelson Mandela Foundation sitting in front. Thank you so much for your leadership. To our host, the province of KwaZulu-Natal, another big, big thank you. We have felt the warmth of your hospitality, and uh, Premier, you have an incredible team, so please convey our gratitude to the team. To our headline sponsor and long-term institutional friend, Old Mushwa, led by Ntate Trevor Manuel. Thank you so much for the support that you keep giving us. I don't, I don't think you heard me earlier on. Kimu Regi. You clap harder, guys. So, so, uh, <laughs> Mandela, at this point, you actually don't even uh, say, uh, you can't translate Mureki, by the way, Prime Minister, sorry. Uh, when you say Baya, it's not, it's, uh, no, uh, Kimureki. Uh, so, uh, co coincidentally, uh, maybe it was planned to be like this. Uh, today is also uh, the birthday of the CEO of the Old Mutual Foundation, Felix Lasse, who is sitting here. Happy birthday, sis. So without our sponsors and our institutional partners, the long lecture would not be what it is and would not be possible. So I acknowledge the board of the Nelson Mandela Foundation, the office of the Prime Minister of Barbados. Alice, without you, we wouldn't be here. You know, you are one incredible human being. I don't know where you're sitting, but thank you so much. South Africa's uh, presidential office and uh, DERCO, they have been incredible. Um, AXA, Reket, who are uh, Mureki number two. Uh, so you have to clap, guys. Uh, Video Vision, whose uh, work you've been seeing on the screens. Southern Sun, Airlink, MSC, who will be hosting us later the Hans Seidel Foundation, Vodacom, who are our longest uh, standing uh, donor and uh, supporter of our work. Thank you, Vodacom, for the work that you keep doing with us. Uh, you have to. Ticket <clears throat> from Audi, who for the last 18 years of the 20, Audi has been the, uh, the people who have been transporting all our speakers, so we are grateful. Uh, Hulamin, PepsiCo, Brand South Africa, One, Sunday Times, SABC, Black Motion, 
and our commentators today were Sylvia Graham, McFarlane Muledi, and Catherine Constanides, who is a, a, a climate activist in our country and also a Tutu Fellow, if I may add. Um, then the uh, SA language uh, interpreters, the two ladies who are here, Os Andi Swa and Os Sandile. Thank you very much. And of course, your entertainment today will be coming from the Drakensberg Boys Choir, who you saw earlier. They will be giving you a couple items again. Lady Smith, Black Mambazo are coming on. This being, I think, the 30th anniversary, Anant, uh, the 30th anniversary of uh, Sarafina. Sarafina will be here on stage. And of course, I saw uh, the, my dear sister, thank you so much for being here. And Sis Leleti Kumalo, who is here. And Ntatem uh, Bongeningema and, uh, will be performing here also tonight. I am, as always, grateful to the Nelson Mandela Foundation team to see the videos that they were sending around 1 a.m. showing us the work that they were still doing. So what you see here was finished in the early hours of this morning, and they were still up doing what you're seeing here. So to all of you, I'm forever grateful. You always go the extra mile, and thank you all for being here with us tonight. Uh, and I want to thank uh, the ICC also, and those who are also joining us on various platforms around the world. Thank you. I'd like to now call on stage the Drakensberg Golf uh, Boys Choir. Why do I call them golf boys? Uh, boys Choir. It's because I was doing a golf thing recently. So, um, so the, the Drakensberg Boys Choir will, will be giving us a couple of items. Uh, thank you very much again. Good night.
much more, but uh, uh, halfway through, the, 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 our dignitaries will leave the stage. Thank you very much.
Lady Smith, Black Mambazo is coming through, but also they are coming back here. So please stay seated. So when you get to me now, I'm going to get to you. 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 Healing Yelanga, Healing Yelanga, Basumona, How Healing Yelanga, Healing Yelanga, Basumona, One Aming and Pigamato, Healing Yelanga, Basumona, Wafelagi, Mibu, Healing Yelanga, Basumona, One Aming and Fuma, Healing Yelanga, Basumona, Alisagi, Healing Yelanga, Basumona, Healing Yelanga, Basumona, How Healing Shalom to me. 
song is homeless so if you know the song or you think you know the song please sing with us we are going to start the song and we all sing Homeless, homeless, when 
Somebody sing, hee 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 hee. Somebody sing, hello hello hello. Somebody say, hee 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 hee. Somebody cry, why why why. Somebody say, hee 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 hee. Somebody sing, hello hello hello. Somebody say, hee 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 hee. Somebody cry, why why why. Somebody say, hee 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 hee. Hee 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 hee. Hee 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 Somebody sing. Somebody sing. Hello, hello, hello. Somebody say. Somebody cry. Why, why, why? Somebody sing. Somebody sing. Hello, hello, hello. Somebody say. Somebody cry. Why, why, why? Kuluman, Kuluman, Kuluman is singing. Ah, 
of one Rebek. I saw him in the history book. He was wearing that funny straw hat. I was young by then. They took our land. They took our country. They took our golden diamonds, 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 diamonds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. 